Hello, and welcome to Shimadzu's Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. This is session 4, looking at advanced liquid injection techniques. My name is Ollie Stacey, and I'll be your presenter for this session. I'm also part of the GC GCMS technical team for Shimadzu in the UK, and have been with Shimadzu for over two and a half years. Before this, my experience was in time of flight GCMS hardware and I have prior expertise in both GC by GC and GC by GCMS. This is the fourth session in our Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. If you missed any of the previous sessions, I recommend you watch them and then sign up to the next available slot for this session. All previous sessions are available on demand and can be accessed on our website. Please do also continue to join us over the coming weeks, where we'll be further developing our knowledge and understanding of GC. In the coming weeks, we'll be expanding our GC knowledge by looking at alternatives to liquid injection before focusing on the opposite end of the instrument, the detector. We'll then look at how we process the data our detector produces before moving on to maintenance and troubleshooting tips and tricks. As I mentioned at the start, Today, we'll be focusing on advanced GC inlets, those that aren't quite as common as the split splitless inlet, but are required for specific situations and applications. Now you're all experts on the split splitless inlet, we'll look at when this isn't suitable and what the alternatives are. Specifically, we'll look at the Programmable Temperature Vaporization Inlet, or PTV for short. We'll also look at the On Column Inlet, or call on column inlet, depending on instrument vendor. Finally, we'll take a look at the multi-mode inlets, which, as their name suggests, can perform multiple injection techniques from a single device. We'll also look at how we can break the rules that Andy taught us about injection volume so that we can get away with injecting large volumes, sometimes in the hundreds of microliters. So last time Andy covered the most popular inlet, the split splitless inlet commonly abbreviated to SPL or SSL. Let's take a look at when we need to consider an alternative inlet. As you know, the SPL inlet covers the vast majority of GC applications. But GC is a hugely versatile technique that can be used for thousands of different applications. And, unfortunately, the SPL doesn't offer a one-size-fits-all solution. There are five main reasons when using an SPL isn't suitable. These are samples containing thermally labile compounds or compounds with a very wide boiling point range, standardized methods such as ASTM, DIN, EN and ISO that dictate a specific hardware setup or demand a specific performance, samples with a very high matrix and of course if our sample isn't a liquid at all. In this session We'll cover the first four of these in more detail, and then in the next session, we'll look at how we can introduce non liquid samples to the GC. Let's start with thermally labile compounds. This is probably one of the most common reasons why an SPL isn't suitable and why we need to look for alternatives. As we know, to operate effectively, a split splitless inlet needs to vaporize all components within the sample. Standard analytical methods usually use an inlet temperature of around 250 degrees in order to do this. For some compounds, this temperature is high enough to cause them to undergo thermal degradation. That is, when they transform into different compounds under high temperatures. It's therefore no longer possible to analyse the compounds in their original state, because they end up forming different products inside the instrument. The obvious option would simply be to reduce the inlet temperature. But this has problems as it results in not all components being effectively vaporised. This would leave behind less volatile species, affecting the results and building up contamination in the liner. One application where thermally labile compounds are a common issue is in pesticide screening. This is performed on a wide range of samples such as water, crops and foodstuffs to ensure consumer and environmental safety. Many of the pesticides that are screened readily undergo thermal degradation under standard analytical conditions. One example of a thermally labile pesticide is Folpet, which you can see on the screen. 
When injected into the GC, the temperatures cleave the nitrogen sulfur bond, forming thalamide. The major issue here is that thalamide is often one of the target compounds that is being analysed, so the results would display a lower concentration of folpet and a higher concentration of thalamide than were actually in the sample. So how can we reliably analyse these troublesome compounds? Well, the main way to do this is by using a different type of GC inlet. The SPL inlet is used isothermally, whereby the temperature stays the same throughout the analysis. The solution to our dilemma is to use a GC inlet that has a temperature that can be adjusted during the analysis. This technique is known as programmable temperature vaporisation. Yes, it's a bit of a mouthful, so you'll almost always hear it referred to as PTV. So what's the difference compared to the SPL? Well, we need to be able to heat it in a controllable manner, which means we need to change the design to reduce the thermal mass of the inlet body. This is what a PTV looks like on the inside. It has a much slimmer body than the SPL, which allows it to heat from one temperature to another in a very controlled way, with a uniform temperature across the entire unit. However, the slim body means the liner also has to go on a bit of a diet and slim down. In fact, the liner loses about 80% of its volume, reducing it to under 100 microliters. Apart from that, all the other physical parts are exactly the same. We still have the purge and split line, just like on an SPL, and they often use the same style scepter and column connections to simplify maintenance. The key difference with the PTV inlet is that the injection is performed when the inlet is cold, by which I mean the inlet temperature is below the boiling point of the solvent. Typical starting temperatures are around 40 to 50 degrees. By doing this, our liquid sample remains a liquid after injection. After the injection is complete, the inlet heats up at a specified rate, up to a maximum of around 250 degrees Celsius per minute on most PTVs. Most can also use a series of different temperature ramps and plateaus to suit the analysis. Let's take a look in a bit more detail at what's going on inside. To make it clear what's going on, I've got a green liquid. In the real world, if it's not a clear liquid, you should probably refrain from injecting it in your GC. The sample is first injected into the plug of glass wall inside the liner, whilst the inlet is cold. This should be at a temperature that is low enough to prevent instant vaporisation of the solvent. As the inlet begins to heat up, the volatile solvent, in blue, begins to evaporate from the glass wall, mix with the carrier gas and travel onto the head of the column. The thermally labile analyte in our sample, denoted in yellow, remains as a liquid on the wall. The analyte then starts to vaporise as the inlet temperature reaches the compound's boiling point. As it vaporises, the analyte's vapour is mixed with the carrier gas and, again, travels onto the column. This ensures that the compound has left the inlet before the temperature reaches the analyte's thermal decomposition point. As the inlet reaches its final temperature, any remaining compounds continue to vaporise and transfer onto the column, to ensure there's not a build-up of contamination in the inlet. Once all the components are transferred onto the column, the inlet can begin to cool down, ready for the next analysis. It's worth noting that modern PTV systems have a cooling fan to increase the cooling rate back to the initial starting temperature. This significantly improves the time taken to analyse each sample, enabling more samples to be tested every day. In terms of operation, a PTV is very similar to an SPL. A PTV has both split and purge flows and can be operated in either split or splitless mode. Exactly the same principles apply that Andy covered in the last session. The only way that it differs in operation 
is that the method will contain additional parameters for the temperature program. In an SPL method, there is a single inlet temperature, whereas the PTV has a program table, just like the oven. You might also find that there are some additional settings for the fan, such as what temperature it switches on at. It's also possible for the inlet to be cooled below room temperature using either a liquid cryogen, such as CO2 or nitrogen, or using a Peltier cooler. These are not particularly common and most applications don't warrant them, but it's worth knowing that they exist. With a PTV, the temperature program is usually designed to transfer the analytes to the column in as narrow a band as possible, to ensure sharp peaks. There is obviously a consideration to ensure the rate is not too high that labile compounds aren't able to transfer to the column before the inlet reaches their decomposition temperature. So there might be a fast ramp to vaporise the volatile components efficiently, and then a hold to ensure the labile compounds have time to transfer to the column. That is often followed by a second ramp to a higher temperature to ensure the full sample is vaporised before the inlet cools ready for the next injection. So now we've covered thermally labile components and why an SPL isn't suitable and how a PTV can be used to solve the problems associated with sampling these compounds. Let's now take a look at samples with a wide boiling point range. This is the second most common reason why an SPL isn't suitable. GCs are used very widely in the analysis of crude oil, where there can be compounds with an effective carbon number of anywhere between 4 or 5, right up to 60 and beyond. That corresponds to a boiling point range from 30 degrees to well beyond 650 degrees, all within a single sample. The reason SPLs aren't best suited to these samples is because these types of inlet can suffer from a phenomenon known as mass discrimination. Mass discrimination tends to affect the very volatile and highest boiling point extremes the most. The chromatogram on the screen is of an N-alkane mix, where each alkane is at the same concentration. You'll notice that all the peaks have a relatively similar response. The keen-eyed amongst you might also notice that the peak height tends to drop off a little towards the end. That isn't because there's a lower response for those compounds, it's because, as you'll remember from session 2, the longer the compounds are retained on the column, the broader they become. So, whilst they appear smaller in height, the peak areas are largely the same as those towards the beginning of the chromatogram. This is an example chromatogram without mass discrimination. If we now look at the bottom chromatogram, the height and area significantly reduces for the front few compounds and the back 30% of the chromatogram. We've injected the same sample, but this time we're seeing the impacts of mass discrimination. Mass discrimination is typically calculated by dividing the area of a high boiling component by the area of a compound in the middle of the range, when both are injected at the same concentration. So what causes mass discrimination? Well, it might be surprising to some that it's partly related to the syringe. Here's a schematic of what your syringe looks like. It consists of a barrel, which holds our sample, and the needle, which injects through the septum and into the liner. There's also a plunger in the top, which is used to draw up and eject the sample, but we're not too worried about that for the moment. The syringe is filled to the one microliter mark. It's inserted into the inlet so that the needle sits within the hot liner. The plunger forces one microliter of sample into the inlet and it vaporizes. The issue is that, in reality, that's not the only sample in the syringe. The needle also has an internal volume, which is also filled with sample. And in most syringes, this volume equates to around half a microliter. So, as the syringe injects into the hot inlet, 
the 1 microliter of sample is ejected from the barrel, but there's still 0.5 microliters remaining in the needle. And that needle is sat inside a very hot inlet. An inlet which is specifically designed to vaporize any sample that enters it. This means that the sample within the needle rapidly starts to heat up, causing some of the sample to vaporize. As it does so, it expands out of the needle and into the liner. In essence, we've not injected one microliter. We've injected one microliter plus a portion of the volume inside the needle, totaling somewhere between 1 and 1.5 microliters. Now, this wouldn't be too big a problem, except for the fact that the needle and its contents tend not to reside in the inlet for a very long time. Most injections occur in under a second. That means the needle doesn't heat up sufficiently for the full content to vaporize. The very volatile components evaporate rapidly, but the high boilers don't reach their boiling point during the injection process. So what we end up with is the equivalent of around one and a half microliters of very volatile components injected, but only one microliter of the high boiling compounds, and somewhere in the middle for the compounds in between. So that explains the losses we see at the back end, but we can also see some slight losses on the front too. The most obvious reason for losing volatile components is from the sample evaporation during preparation, or from the vial before the sample is analysed. Fortunately, modern GC systems have advanced significantly in the past 5-10 to 10 years, considerably reducing the effects of mass discrimination. Autosamplers can now perform injections in fractions of a second, to reduce the additional evaporation of volatiles from the needle. Flow controllers often have processes built directly on the controller to increase response time to fluctuations, and both inlet and liner design have been improved. Despite all of this, they're not perfect, so there is still a requirement for alternative techniques, such as PTV, to eliminate mass discrimination entirely. Unfortunately, most standard methods are not based on the latest technology. Many of these standardised methods are deep-rooted in the quality of products such as fuels and engine oils. Development of the methods often takes a long time, so progress in updating them can be cripplingly slow. They therefore tend to be based on older technologies, such as packed columns, or don't take into account the advancements of more modern systems. Nevertheless, there are also some methods where it is still valid and correct to use an alternative inlet, especially where a very wide boiling point range is used. One such example of this, where an SPL definitely isn't suitable, is ASTM D7169. This is a standardised test method for the boiling point distribution of crude oils. This is commonly referred to as simulated distillation, or SIMDIST as the GC is used to simulate a fractional distillation tower to determine the initial and final boiling points, as well as the percentage of components that lie within specific boiling point ranges. It requires analysis of compounds from around pentane, which is a straight chain alkane of 5 carbon atoms, up to compounds with an effective carbon number of over 100 which equates to a boiling point of around 720 degrees. For this method, an inlet with a programmable temperature is essential to ensure there is no mass discrimination. The method has a verification test, where the mass discrimination for a range of alkanes between C10 and C50 relative to C20 must have a value between 0.9 and 1.1. This method can be used with a PTV, but companies often tend towards using an on-column injection technique instead. As its name suggests, an on-column inlet involves the sample being injected directly into the column, instead of into a glass liner. Because the sample is injected into the column, there is no chance of using a split line to dilute the sample. This technique is truly splitless. There are two main benefits of injecting directly into the column. Firstly, a true splitless injection offers advantages from a sensitivity point of view, as the syringe empties itself into the column, meaning there's no chance of losses. 
Secondly, injection into the column bypasses the liner. Although most liners are chemically treated to deactivate them, there can still be some active sites within them. This can cause some compounds, especially ones that are more polar, to stick to the active sites and reduce the response at the detector. In very extreme cases, it's possible that compounds might get fully stuck and then never be seen at the detector at all, despite being in the sample. The same is true of very chemically labile compounds that could react with active sites to break down to decomposition products. Whilst a PTV injector can use a range of columns and works with a standard syringe, an OCI is a little more restrictive. In order for the needle to fit within the column, the needle's outer diameter must be smaller than the column's inner diameter. This immediately rules out narrow bore columns, as a suitably narrow needle just isn't possible. For on column injection, the column must be 0.53 mm internal diameter. This does make sense given the sample cannot be split, so the column must be able to handle a potentially high sample concentration. However, on column injectors are also used for trace analysis, when narrower bore columns are more common. This makes a 0.53 mm ID column limiting especially when we consider that most analytical methods are based on narrow ID columns, such as the trusty 0.25mm. It's also not usually possible to use 0.53mm ID columns with vacuum detectors like mass spec. So, in these situations, we use a two-column setup. The first is the 0.53mm ID column we need for the on-column injection process but we use a fused silica shell that has no stationary phase on the inside. These are commonly referred to as retention gaps, restrictors, or simply fused silica. This is, in effect, our liner, and is commonly a few metres in length. The end of this is installed into a connector, which joins this retention gap to our analytical column. These connections are commonly called unions. The next issue we have is the syringe. Normal syringes are 23 gauge, with a needle outer diameter of 0.67mm. This is clearly larger than 0.53mm inner diameter of the column, so it's not possible to use them. Instead, we have to use a 0.47mm OD needle, or 26 gauge. Unfortunately, these 26 gauge needles tend to be more prone to bending due to their narrowness, so you'll often find that syringes used with on column injectors are a hybrid of the two. These are known as tapered needles, where the top, which doesn't go into the column, is 23 gauge, and the bottom, which needs to fit inside the column, is 26 gauge. For an on column inlet, operation is much the same as with the PTV. The only thing to remember is there's no option to split away any sample. The injection mode is splitless, and is sometimes referred to as direct. In terms of the temperature program, think of this inlet as an extension of your GC oven, because it's housing the column in exactly the same way that the oven does. This means it's often applicable to use the same temperature program for both the inlet and the oven. Some methods specify an offset, usually where the inlet temperature is always slightly higher than the oven temperature, to ensure that there are no cold spots before the sample is transferred to the column. So here we have, side by side, our three most common inlets, the SPL, the PTV, and the OCI. Between these three inlets, almost all types of liquid sampling can be performed. And, Whilst we could install all of them on a single GC, this can be labour intensive to switch columns from one inlet to another. One of the key features people want more and more from their GC and GCMS systems is flexibility and the ability to future proof. The logical solution in your head right now might be to simply use a PTV inlet for everything. Unfortunately, PTVs are only really suitable for cold split or cold splitless injections 
Earlier on, I mentioned that a PTV is a much slimmer version of the SPL, reducing the liner volume by around 80%. If we were to perform a standard hot injection, the expansion volume of even the smallest injection would exceed the capacity of the liner. For this reason, PTVs offer very poor reproducibility and robustness for standard hot split and splitless injections. And this is where multi-mode inlets excel. Multi-mode inlets, such as the Optic 4, were designed to offer a single injector that combats the two main issues with the SPL and PTV inlets. By definition, a true multi-mode inlet, or MMI, must be able to do the two following things. It must be able to perform a hot split or splitless injection with high reproducibility and without the limitations of a very low liner volume. And it must also be able to perform cold split or splitless injections with no mass discrimination, effectively combining the SPL and PTV. In fact, most modern MMIs can offer many more sampling techniques than just these. The Optic 4 has a liner volume that is similar to a typical SPL, yet it is able to heat at incredible rates of up to 60 degrees per second. This is achieved by using direct heating technology and allows the inlet to perform a wide range of analytical techniques, including hot split and splitless injections like an SPL, cold split and splitless injections like a PTV, but with a faster heating rate for sharper peak shape. With an adapter, they can also perform direct on-column injections, like an OCI can. They can also perform a host of other techniques, such as pyrolysis and thermal desorption, which we'll be covering next time. They can also perform in-system derivatization to reduce the preparation time of samples. And then they can perform techniques such as difficult matrix introduction, or DMI, where a sample, such as some liquid hand soap, is placed in a small cup within the inlet. It's then analysed directly, whilst ensuring the non-volatile components remain in the cup to prevent the system becoming contaminated. The Optic 4 is also able to perform a technique called Large Volume Injection, or LVI, where it's possible to inject large volumes of sample sometimes in excess of 100 microliters, to improve sensitivity for ultra-trace analysis. This is often required when analysing pesticides in water, where the regulatory limits are so low that extreme techniques are required to achieve detection. Large volume injection is achieved by using either a fritted liner with a high sample capacity or a slow injection speed to ensure the liquid sample is retained in the liner and doesn't drip through onto the column. Injection volumes are typically in the range of 20 to 250 microliters. The inlet temperature is kept cool, so the solvent evaporation occurs in a slow, controllable manner, to prevent a huge expansion volume. This evaporation occurs with a very high split ratio, usually at least 100 to 1 to ensure the vast majority of solvent travels out of the split line rather than onto the column. The Optic 4 is unique in the sense that it uses a solvent monitor in the split line that can detect when the solvent evaporation is complete. This enables the system to know when it's safe to close the split vent and heat the inlet to transfer the analytes onto the column. The inlet can then heat rapidly to transfer the sample. From that point, everything works exactly the same as a slitless injection on a PTV. It's important to note that the solvent needs to be more volatile than the analytes, or these will get lost during the solvent evaporation step. So there we have it, four inlets, each with their own benefits. To try and give you a visual overview of when each inlet type is suitable, here's a tabulated summary. I won't go through each of these now, but it shows you when an inlet is ideally suited, in green, not great, but not impossible, in yellow, and unsuitable, in red. So to summarise, the split splitless inlet is best suited to hot split and hot splitless injections. One alternative to the SPL 
is the Programmable Temperature Vaporization Inlet, or PTV. This is suitable for cold split and cold splitless injections. It differs from the SPL by having a programmable temperature and a smaller liner volume. The next alternative to an SPL is the on-column injector, or OCI, which is suitable for cold splitless injections. It's very similar to a PTV, but offers no split capabilities. It has specific hardware requirements, needing a 0.53mm ID column or attention gap to be installed into the inlet, and a 26 gauge needle, or tapered needle, for the injection. Remember that you cannot use a PTV or OCI for hot split or hot splitless injections. Where hot split and splitless and cold split or splitless injections are required, multi-mode inlets can combine the functionality of an SPL and PTV into a single unit. With a small adapter, they can also become an on-column injection unit too. Please do join us next time where we'll be looking at alternatives to liquid injection. This session will cover headspace, thermal desorption, solid phase microextraction, pyrolysis and gas sampling. Please do also join Shimadu UK's eNews. As well as finding out about new webinars and workshops, you'll receive exciting information about the latest analytical technology and application notes. Look out for the link in our follow-up email or go to the website and click on eNews. If you'd like to get in contact with us and are joining us from the UK, please use the contact details on screen. For those joining from outside the UK, you can find contact details for your local Shimadu office by visiting Shimadu's global analytical website. Just go to www.shimadu.com forward slash an and click on contact search in the top right of the screen. That's all from me for this session. Thank you very much for your attention and please enjoy the rest of your day. Excellence in science, Shimazu.